A very good morning to everyone. On behalf of CEF CRNTS, it's my honor to welcome you all to the talk 10 of our webinar series on electron microscopy. I will begin with an overview of CEF IIT Bombay, which was inaugurated by our late ex Prime Minister Sri Murarji Desai. Instrumental methods of analysis form an indispensable aspect of any research and development program. The Department of Science and Technology, that is DSD, set up the sophisticated analytical instruments facility, that is CEF, in different parts of the country. The main objective of setting up these facilities was to provide guidance in acquisition of data using sophisticated instruments. Professor Anil Kotin Tarail is currently heading our CEF CRNTS department in IIT Bombay. CEF IIT Bombay has several analytical instruments and provides measurement services to IIT Bombay users and to users from other colleges, universities, national laboratories and various industries. The current slide shows the list of instruments funded by DSD in which three of the electron microscopes have been highlighted. The one at the bottom is an upcoming facility, a dual beam focused electron and ion beam, which will be installed soon. This slide shows the list of instruments which come under central facility funded by IIT Bombay. Two of the electron microscopes are highlighted here also. The current slide highlights three of our transmission electron microscopes. One of them is a conventional TEM and the other two are field emission gun based instruments with different analytical capabilities. The 200 kV FEG TEM has energy dispersive spectroscopy attached with it, while the 300 kV FEG TEM has EDS and electron energy loss spectroscopy that is EELS attached to it. All are in homed at CEF CRNTS. We have created a LinkedIn account for CEF IIT Bombay. We would be happy to connect with you to, through this mode too. The brochure for webinar series is uploaded in this LinkedIn account. Following slide shows the staff at CEF CRNTS. We would be happy to welcome you to CEF and help you with the sample analysis. Top 10 in the webinar series on electron microscopy is on advances in EELS instrumentation and analysis, high speed spectroscopy with extended energy and dynamic range and will be given shortly by Dr. Paulo Longo. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Paulo Longo, who is associated with the Gatan Business Unit in Emitech at Placentin CA in USA. After completing his master's degree in industrial chemistry at the University of Catania, Italy in 2003, his great interest in nanostructures made him decide to pursue for PhD in physics at the University of Glasgow under the supervision of Professor Alan Craver. During his PhD, he learned and mastered yields and STEM based analytical techniques. During this time, he was also partly involved in the development of dual yield system for the simultaneous acquisition of two regions of yield spectrum under the same experimental conditions. The same idea was later implemented in the Gatan GIF quantum. Dr. Longo joined Gatan as a TEM application scientist in March 2011. His hard work did not go unnoticed and he was stepwise promoted to higher positions in the company. He became the Applications and Training Manager in 2014, Business Development Manager Analytical Products in 2016, 
Global Analytical Sales Application Manager in 2018 and is currently the Director of Global Applications since April 2020, leading the Global Sales Application Group, supporting marketing and sales activity, creating all marketing and sales collateral materials. We are sure that this talk will enlighten the knowledge of the upcoming researchers in the field of electron microscopy and encourage them to use electron microscopes. If you have any questions related to the subject, you may post it in the question and answer box. We will try to take it up at the end of the talk. So let us commence today's webinar. Over to you, Dr. Paulo Longo. Thank you very much for uh, for the introduction. I'm gonna share. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, okay, I'm gonna put it there. Okay, um, let's get started. So first of all, I wanna I wanna thank you for uh, for the for the kind introduction, and um, and also for uh, for the opportunity of giving uh, this uh, this presentation. Um, so I'm actually very I'm actually very very happy um, to be involved. So today we're going to talk about uh, EOSA spectroscopy and um, so I'm going to talk about detector but before we start talking about detector I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit the theoretical aspects of EOSA. I'm going to show you some uh, results from uh, uh, from application okay so uh, we start with some fundamentals of electron energy loss uh, uh, spectroscopy so I'm not sure you know the, uh, the level I understand the, audi the audience is Pretty large, so you'll find that this um, you'll find this information and these uh, initial slides are pretty uh, pretty useful. So what is EOS? Um, basically, like uh, what we do with EOS, EOS stands for electron energy loss spectroscopy. So imagine you have a thin specimen here. You have uh, the electrons. Electrons are coming down. These electrons are uh, interacting with uh, with the specimen, with the atoms in the specimen, and they can interact in two different ways. They can interact uh, um, through uh, elastic scattering events. So, in the case in, in the case of elastic scattering events, essentially there's no a significant loss uh, in uh, in energy. In general, uh, uh, the elastic scattering events uh, are uh, when you have an electron interacting with the nucleus of the atoms. So these uh, these electrons are uh, actually scattered at a pretty uh, high angle, and uh, these electrons in general are used for um, uh, let me get the pointer here. Okay, so these electrons are used for uh, uh, um, stem imaging as well as uh, diffraction. Uh, now there's also another type of scattering which is very important to EOS and it's called the elastic scattering. In this particular case, you have uh, actually um, an, a significant amount of uh, energy loss. You can see by this diagram that all these electrons they experience uh, uh, in elastic scattering, so basically they lost a certain amount of energy are all scattered uh, through like a narrow, a narrow angle. So basically, if you can um, put like a large aperture, you're able to collect the most of the signal. Now, the question is, uh, how do these electrons lose energy? And um, the process uh, that uh, make these electrons lose energy is basically an electron to electron uh, interaction. So you can see from here, electrons are coming down. They will excite uh, one of the core shell electrons to uh, an higher, an excited energy level, and they will lose a certain amount of energy. So this amount of energy is what this uh, electron requires uh, to win the attraction from uh, the nucleus. Okay. Now these electrons go is excited now, but what happens? You know that this uh, this electron that was uh, excited now can go back to its original state and emit an X-ray, or an electrons in the outer shells can be emitted. So in this uh, in the second case we talked about. Uh, uh, OJ electron and in the first case is like uh, X-ray. So now the two processes are actually competing with each other. So in general, you can have either an emission on X-ray or an emission of an OJ electron. Now in the case of uh, OJ electron is more favorable for uh, light elements because they have less attraction. Uh, the nucleus has less attraction and X-ray is more favorable for heavy elements. But that actually tells you that uh, um, 
you know, X-ray con pizza with uh, with the jet. But the most important thing is that in order to have the emission uh, or the generation of an X-ray, you need to have an energy loss events. So EOS is always your uh, primary technique, primary analytical technique uh, in uh, in the microscope. Uh, this slide actually shows you a little bit in detail uh, what happens. So again, the incoming electrons that could be, you could fire these electrons uh, with an energy that varies from uh, 300 kV down to 60 kV. We'll excite uh, one of the core shell electrons to so an upper energy level. And what we're going to see, we're going to see a loss uh, in energy, this delta E, which is what we measure. So what we measure in EOS essentially is uh, um, the uh, is basically the difference between uh, the, the initial energy of the incoming electron, which is E0, it corresponds to uh, the high tension or the, the accelerated voltage, uh, minus the delta E, which is uh, the energy that uh, required by the electron to for uh, for a certain interaction, okay, for a certain excitation. That's what we do with EOS. So if you want to summarize the physics of EOS, you would say that all the EOS the signals and the TM results from interaction between the beam and the specimen of the electrons. The advantage of EOS over any other technique, especially EDS, is that EOS always probes primary events and not secondary, like EDS or OJ. The other advantage of EOS is that it's localized. If you remember my first uh, slide where I was showing like a diagram, all the EOS signal is confined over a narrow angle. The other advantage of EOS is that you don't have any uh, artifacts such as uh, fluorescence. Fluorescence is typical of an X-ray when an X-ray travels through the sample and generates other X-ray. The other advantage of EOS is that it's because uh, it's, uh, it depends on, uh, it's, it's caused by this electron-to-electron -electron interaction. You can, uh, you, can, you can basically get information about uh, the chemistry or essentially about the specimen electronic structure of uh, the material. So essentially, you can generate every type of information from uh, from an EOS spectrum. You can extract every type of information. Now, if you've never seen an EOS spectrum, I'm going to walk you through these, uh, the, the next few slides very fast. Uh, but it's very important, especially for those uh, that don't have much experience with EOS. So if you've never seen an EOS spectrum, uh, the EOS spectrum is, is basically divided in different regions. So we have one that is called the zero loss peak. You can tell by the name that you know, basically these electrons didn't experience uh, a significant amount of energy loss. And uh, these uh, electrons correspond to the, uh, the accelerating voltage, essentially. And uh, these electrons are actually important in the zero loss peak are important because you can extract information about the specimen thickness. In a thin specimen, the, the zero loss peak is always the most uh, uh, intense feature. Now, the, uh, the second most prominent feature in a thin specimen is plasmon peak. The plasmon peak, we'll see in the next few slides where it is, but we can get information about the electron density of your material. Also, you can get information about uh, the polarization response, looking at the low loss distribution, but you can also look at near zero loss features such as uh, interband transition. And if you're interested in study um, carbon based materials, uh, people spend quite a lot of time looking at interband transition. And now uh, we can move on to core loss edges. So core loss edges, you can get information about the composition, you can map, but also you can get an um, information about the near edge fine structure. And this is actually what we call in EOS uh, uh, LNES. And they correspond to the first uh, 20 V after the onset, beyond the onset, okay? And then also you can get information about uh, uh, the atom specific uh, radial distribution, essentially the way all these atoms are arranged with each other. So essentially you can extract every type of information from the EOSO spectrum. The whole point of this is try to understand what to do and what to look at in the EOSO spectrum in order to extract uh, these, uh, this information. So this is the zero loss peak. Um, so you can see it's very intense, but again, uh, even though uh, you would think that it's not really that, in, uh, that, um, that important. It actually is because you can get information about the thickness of your specimen. You can use as an energy reference. So I'm going to show you some example in the presentation where we actually measure the chemical shift of your material. But in order to measure the chemical shift, you need to have uh, a reference, okay? And the best reference you, you can find in the also spectrum is the zero loss peak, okay? Um, you can also calibrate uh, your, uh, your camera uh, based on intensity of the zero loss peak, you can extract information about uh, uh, the beam current. Something that 
you know, was developed uh, with the quantum uh, is a dual yield. So basically gives you the ability to collect uh, zero loss peak as well as all the other regions in the yield spectrum under the same condition. Now in the thin specimen, the zero loss peak is actually very intense. But now we developed uh, uh, a lot of tools uh, uh, that enable you to collect uh, different regions of the yield spectrum under the same conditions. Now the plasmon. So you can see from this slide, the plasmon, the plasmon, the second uh, most important feature in uh, in the yield spectrum. And uh, this uh, this actually this feature is originated by electrons that excite uh, you know the electrons in the balance uh, in the balance band. Essentially, they polarize these electrons. You'll see like a, a very intense uh, intense peak and. Uh, the intensity of this peak is actually given by is proportional to the, uh, the electron density of your material. So this is actually very important because um, you can get uh, you can you can you can see you can have little changes in your material in terms of the electronic structure, and then from there you see changes in the elect in uh, in the plasmon peak, and from there you can extract uh, the, the electron density of your material. And this is all this is enabled by the Gitan software, and it runs all automatic. OK, but this is actually very important that we could do some sort of uh, uh, chemical phase mapping. Uh, this is an example of uh, looking at uh, changes in, uh, in the plasmon P. So here we are looking at some uh, aluminum lithiate, aluminum lithiate precipitates. Now uh, the matrix is all made of aluminum, but we have some precipitates, a very small amount of uh, aluminum lithiate and um, Obviously, you put this in the TM, you see nothing because the lithium is very light. But this, even this a small amount of lithium is enough to change the electron density of the material. And then you would experience a change in, uh, in the plasmon peak. So imagine you could get an image and just focusing on, uh, on the plasmon peak. Um, so looking at how this plasmon peak changes, if you, you want to look at the aluminum lithium precipitates, uh, we can get an image uh, focusing uh, on these electrons only. And uh, in a matter of seconds, you get an image that will alight uh, uh, the presence of these uh, uh, precipitates in your material. So very fast. There's no any, any other technique in the war in uh, available that could give you this type of information. Another example that was published in Science is actually looking at uh, um, the temperature of your material. When you when the temperature changes, the ma the material can expand or can contract. And as a result of that, you will see a change uh, in the electron density. And we can we can see we can actually see that in the yield spectrum. In this particular case that was published in Science, you see like a little shift of the plasmon peak by a fraction of EB. And based on that, uh, you can um, calibrate uh, uh, the position of the plasmon based on uh, based on temperature. And then from there, you can actually see how the temperature changes down to the nanoscale. So essentially, you can. Use uh, EOS as a sort of uh, a thermometer, um, as a sort of nanoscale thermometer. So this is actually pretty cool. Another example, if you're interested in uh, polymers or carbon-based material, in this example here we have poly, uh, polyethylene is the matrix so with some precipitates of polystyrene, and you you know you want to be able to uh, to image these polystyrene precipitates, but unfortunately everything is made of carbon and hydrogen, and it becomes very very complicated. To, to, to generate any contrast in the TM image. But in the case of the polystyrene, uh, the carbon atoms are uh, double bonded, okay? As a result of that, uh, you have uh, uh, the presence of an interband transition, which actually is pretty strong around seven, uh, uh, seven AB. So now you can decide to take an image and use only the electrons around seven AB. And now you get pretty good image with a good contrast that shows you the presence of all these uh, uh, precipitates of uh, um, uh, of uh, polystyrene. So basically, I showed you how you can use EOS to look at polymers, and this was that these uh, polymers, as you know, are pretty beam sensitive. You wouldn't be able to resolve this structure with EDS, and then uh, everything was done in a matter of eight seconds. Now you want to get some optical information from your material. You can always convert an EOS spectrum to a light spectrum. Now, in this particular example, we have a particle that has a triangular uh, triangular shape, and we can extract uh, EOS spectra from different regions. So if you extract uh, from region A, you have a strong uh, uh, feature that is typical of the near infrared uh, region and is centered around the 1.75 EB. 
um, and then you know you can move uh, uh, you can move uh, you know on the other side and you are in the region B so you have a very strong uh, uh, feature uh, typical of uh, visible light and it's centered around 2.7 EV there's another one in the UEB that is around 320 EV now you can map the entire particle and you can extract uh, these features point by point and you can actually map them spatially so you can see basically where all these uh, all these different uh, 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 surface plasmons are actually um, are actually located in uh, in the structure. Coralos electrons, you know, you can tell by the name. These electrons are originated by excitations of the coralos uh, uh, of the coralos electrons, and these are actually important for elemental identification, concentration, chemical state, as well as uh, local environment. Now, you want to do quantification. Um, for those of you who've been uh, blessed to use uh, uh, GMS3, uh, which is our uh, latest software, everything is fully automated. The software will fit the background for you, uh, will uh, fit an integration window, and it will give you quantification uh, automatically. So that's an example of our born HI. So with this new software, essentially you just have to type uh, the elements uh, in the periodic table, and the software will do everything for you. But now the advantage of EOS is actually you can get chemical information. Essentially, you have enough energy resolution to look to look at the uh, near edge fine structure of your material. But I, how do we originate this uh, um, near edge fine structure in the EOS spectrum? Now we talked about the uh, these uh, this shell uh, this core shell electrons uh, can be excited to um, a certain excited level. But now this excited level, uh, the energy of this excited level uh, really depends on the level of hybridization of bonding uh, with uh, with other atoms, with the other atoms, for example. As a result of that, the energy will change. And now you're going to see different features depending also on the on the excitation of that particular uh, uh, of certain electrons. OK, that's for example, uh, we have here titanium. You can see four different peaks in the, in the case of uh, Titanium, which are typical of uh, titanium for plus, but looking at the shape, you can actually tell that this titanium uh, oxide is in the uh, is in uh, anatase phase. So this is pretty good. It gives you actually that additional information. Um, just to give a little bit another example, so here we have algan, and we start replacing um, um, aluminum, uh, sorry, aluminum atoms with gallium atoms. So you can see the shape. Uh, changes so the structure here is essentially the same but what is changing uh, is uh, the fine structure because obviously we're changing uh, uh, we're changing uh, the chemistry around uh, around the nitrogen so you can see like a change in the fine structure going from 50% uh, uh, aluminum to essentially 50% uh, gallium in your material so you see like a big change in the fine structure Another example here is actually doing iron uh, uh, oxide. So here we have iron oxide grown on top of uh, uh, substrate, but you can see that at the interface, uh, it's a lot of green, so you have a, a lot of iron 2 plus. And you know, it's because we have enough energy resolution here that we can distinguish uh, uh, different features from iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. You can see in the case of iron 3 plus, so you have uh, uh, a distinguished uh, uh, pre-peak here and also you're able to split uh, uh, the L2 peak and you see the ratio between the L, uh, you know the, the L3 and L2 is different depending on the oxidation state from there you can extract uh, right away you can tell uh, the oxidation state of your material but the software is also capable enough uh, powerful enough uh, to map the distribution of each different phase in your material um, another uh, very good case for eels uh, to, um, to, uh, to look at is uh, uh, the carbon. So the carbon can be present in different chemical phases depending on uh, uh, the arrangements of uh, the atoms. So in this particular case, so we have a diamond where the, each carbon atom is surrounded by the other uh, four atoms of carbon. So the diamond is an insulator, but it doesn't show any uh, pi star peak. OK, so from there you can tell right away this is diamond looking at the shape. But as you start actually adding, uh, uh, you know, removing some SP, SP3 to add some SP2, you start to see the pi star peak. Uh, and then at some points in the case of graphite, there is 100% uh, SP2. You see like uh, a very 
uh, intense uh, uh, pi star peak. And from there, actually, you can even tell uh, uh, spatially where uh, you know the pi star map is present. So essentially, you can see where you have a certain contribution of a certain sp2 contribution in your material. And everything can be done fast, and it's all now built uh, in the software. Even though this example uh, was uh, done like uh, many years ago, but now it's actually possible to do uh, all of these automatically in the software. Now, um, another topic that I want to briefly discuss with you, and EOS versus CDS, because we learn that uh, every time you do EOS, you also have EDS, but in order to have EDS, you need to have EOS, so you need to have energy loss in order to generate X-ray. Okay, so essentially you could do everything nearly simultaneously, actually simultaneously. So this, uh, this graph actually, this chart actually show you the, uh, shows you the differences between EOS and EDS and actually what you can extract from one and what can extract from the other one. But the important thing is uh, that um, EDS actually works pretty good when the sample gets thicker uh, and EDS also works really well when the sample is thin. Um, the other advantage of EOS, and this is actually a major advantage, is that you can extract chemical information. And we learned from one of the previous examples uh, that you can also get information about uh, optical information about your material. And all this information is now uh, present uh, with, uh, with EDS. So this is actually very important. So this is actually to give a little bit of an example of uh, some of the, the artifacts that you can experience in uh, EDS. So here we have uh, uh, some particles of palladium gold and uh, we see copper in EDS, but there's no copper in the sample because this, the sample is made of uh, palladium and gold only. So you can see in EOS, you, you see the palladium uh, edge here. You also see the gold. Uh, this is the gold M45, gold M23 here. You also see the, uh, uh, the palladium uh, 3200 dB. This is the palladium L23. So that's pretty amazing. It shows you the sensitivity of the detectors. But we still see copper. Again, there's no copper in this sample. So the reason why we see copper here is because the sample was dropped in the copper grid. Okay. So if you look at um, um, if we look at uh, like a copper, uh, uh, we try to detect uh, the presence of copper in EOS. We don't see any copper in the EOS spectrum. So actually, that shows you that EOS is the proof because the signal is highly localized. In the case of EDS, the signal is not localized. Now, this is actually to give a quick example. When it comes to quantification, all the information that you have to give to the software in order to carry out uh, an accurate quantification with EDS. In the case of EOS, essentially, we need only information about the semi-angle, collection semi-angle, and it's pretty straightforward. Quick example, uh, just going to show you some comparison between EOS and EDS, and this data was collected in uh, using uh, the instrumenting graphs, which is a Titan with um, uh, XFEC with uh, four quadrant EDS detector. So the system has four different EDS system, and as a EOS spectrometer, we have a quantum here. OK, so we looked at this again, the same particle we did before. Uh, this is palladium gold. Uh, it was done in EOS mode, EDS all together. And this is our, uh, the EOS uh, map for palladium, EDS map for palladium. I mean, you can tell it's kind of like a core shell structure here, but the resolution of EOS is uh, superior, but this is because of the physics. You know, the EOS signal is always um, uh very localized whereas the eds is not localized it's all over the place we actually we're actually finding uh, copper and there's no copper in this sample okay so you see that the resolution is higher with uh, with eos but even if when you do the gold and you would think the gold is like eds is more favorable but now even e also wins on the gold and if we go measure uh, the single to noise actually we find that in this case in the case of gold the single to noise ratio is twice as good in the case of uh, EOS over uh, EDS. And this is actually using a state-of-the-art uh, EDS system with four uh, EDS detectors all together. And you can put some colors, and then you see that actually you have a lot more, a lot, a lot higher resolution of contrast in uh, EOS maps. You can look at another example. So here we have, this is a device. Again, there's a lot of carbon here. This is the platinum carbide that is deposited as a result of uh, specimen preparation using FIB. Uh, we see some spots here in the carbon map, which are uh, invisible in EDS, simply because uh, EDS doesn't have enough uh, 
uh, not enough uh, uh, sensitivity towards uh, uh, light elements such as uh, carbon. And you can also see the diffusion of gold, which is not very clear in the EDS map. So, you know, on here you can actually see the uh, EDS, uh, EOS winds. And this is again is because of the physics. You always have EOS first and then you have EDS. Now, let me show you a couple of uh, quick examples. This is actually from my own town. And uh, looking at some uh, uh, graph, uh, graphitic layers uh, grown on top of uh, uh, graphene. Okay. So this is actually looking at silicon carbide. The silicon carbide, you anneal the silicon carbide, the silicon atom dissolve, and uh, all the carbon atoms are uh, rearranged to form a graphitic layer. You can extract this, so you see a lot of different layers, and the number of layers really depends on the temperature. So if you extract a spectrum from uh, here, this is a dual spectrum, low loss with a zero loss peak, you see a very strong interband transition, the plasmon, now we know what these features are. And then you see also uh, carbon, uh, carbon, you see like a carbon, uh, uh, carbon spectrum here, a very strong uh, pi star peak, a very strong sigma star peak. The important thing is looking at how these, uh, these features in the carbon peak uh, changes. You see that actually, you see the, la the level of uh, pi star peak and sigma star become very intense uh, right here in the center. So tell you that this layer actually the best. If you look at the interface, you also see some silicon that is uh, uh, drift, uh, changing in, in uh, chemical shift. This is because uh, most likely you might have some oxygen at the interface and you form some silicon oxycarbide. The oxygen is electronegative, it will pull charge from, uh, from the silicon. But based on this data, you could tell that uh, you have a lot of layer here, but you get the sharpest pi star peak, a sharpest sigma star peak, which are an indication of the uh, of the high crystallinic and the low number of defects in your material um, from essentially looking at these top layers here. This is looking at some uh, atomic EOS map from a thermoelectric uh, material, I think it is. Uh, there are some cavities of uh, neodymium, and these cavities are actually filled by calcium atoms. This is a very nice atomic EOS map. It's done in a few minutes. Again, we have uh, uh, neodymium cavity you can see in uh, in um, in the green, but where there's a blue, so your cavity replaced by calcium atom. This was done uh, in a low magnification, but still atomic, and you can tell how all these cavities are actually filled by uh, calcium atoms. Another example, looking at fuel cell material. So this is looking at cyanide and yttria stabilized zirconia grown on top of sea oxide. You see the interface is actually very, doesn't look very sharp. In one single spectrum over the region in blue, you can see oxygen, ceria, yttria, and zirconia, okay? So you pretty much you are able uh, to collect uh, all the elements present in this, in this specimen, okay? You can map them down to the atomic level. The interesting thing is uh, that now, we have an atomic map, but we also have a chemical map uh, where we can see uh, the Syria. So we have a Syria 4 plus, a Syria 3 plus all together. And you can see the fine structure of Syria different going from Syria 3 plus to Syria 4 plus. And the software is able uh, to use this as a reference and map uh, their uh, distribution across the sample. Now you see that this is actually very sharp uh, uh, on uh, its stabilized zirconia. And you could do this um, over a much larger scale. This was done uh, with um, uh, with the quantum. And again, you can see the interface is actually very sharp, but the roughness is between uh, C-oxide 3 plus and C-oxide 4 plus. Another example, looking at lithium uh, manganite treated under ozone. So lithium is actually very important material. We want to see the distribution of lithium, but instead of actually looking at the lithium, we look at the presence of manganese and we look at the chemistry of manganese. So we have two different types of manganese. Manganese 3 plus, which is actually all uh, uh, concentrated uh, right along the edges of this particle. And you see there's a chemical shift uh, towards low energy. You also see the pi, uh, sorry, the pre-peak of oxygen uh, uh, dropping in intensity. Okay. Now, uh, in the case of uh, lithium manganite, like in this particular case, the manganese is, is uh, 3 plus. Without lithium, it would be man uh, manganese oxide and the manganese is 4 plus. So from here, you can actually see 
the distribution of lithium just looking at the chemistry of manganese. Another example is looking at uh, iron oxide uh, nanoparticle. So we have iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus, and now you can see the distribution of iron, iron 3 plus is the green, iron 2 plus is red. But you see the distribution of these two different chemistry, different oxi oxidation state is actually uh, site dependent. So big particles have a lot of uh, iron 2 plus, small particles have uh, iron 3 plus more abundant. Okay, now let me switch gear and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, GIF Continuum, which is our latest uh, uh, system. I showed you a little bit of example. All the example that I showed you before uh, were collected using uh, um, using a, a GIF uh, uh, using a GIF quantum. So this was released in um, 2000, uh, uh, 2018. Um, a lot of we made a lot of improvements, but this is actually targeted for advanced application. Uh, now digital micrograph is Python compatible, so you just have to uh, be able to use the latest version of digital micrograph. You'll be able to create uh, or to use your uh, Python uh, uh, script uh, in the uh, convert them to digital micrograph. Now we targeted this for data quality, productivity, and advanced application. So now for data quality, we replaced the CCD with the CMOS so that has a low noise high dynamic range. We change uh, this actually scanning uh, with uh, uh, with fiber optics, and this is uh, also uh, gives you like a pretty good uh, MTF at DQE. Everything is fully gain corrected, so there's no need of uh, changing the gain anymore or play with the gain or binning in this case because this is a CMOS. Okay. So if you wonder what the difference between a CCD and CMOS is, I mean this diagram shows you what a CCD is. So you have the charge here, the charge is advanced pixel by pixel, and then it's read out. You want to speed up this process, you bin, so you combine pixel together. So you increase the speed, at the same time you increase the intensity because you're combining pixel together. The problem of uh, a binning is that increase the noise. In the case of a CMOS, the charge is read out independently out of each pixel. So this is actually very important, and uh, it tells you that uh, binning is not required here. OK, because you're not moving any charge at all. So this is an example of a quantum. So this is a Nielsen spectrum. So you bin by 10, you combine 10 pixels into one. So now the energy resolution doesn't change because we've been along the vertical axis. But if you zoom in, you can see there is quite a lot of noise in there. So essentially, you don't want to bin. You don't bin, you, can act you actually have a lot less uh, noise coming from the game. Productivity because we made the uh, the speed of this camera much faster, and every it can be tuned really fast, easy to use, and uh, we have quite a lot of workflows. And uh, we've been giving a lot of webinars over uh, the last few months that shows you actually our new uh, workflows. Uh, let me skip this part because it's not really that important. But I want to show you a little bit uh, what we introduced with uh, with the continuum, which is uh, live mapping. So live mapping, what it works, I mean, you're scanning the beam, you select the area of interest, you uh, select the elements here, click on live map, say capture. You can tell the software how often you want to go for the same area, and the software automatically will generate maps. So you have nitrogen, titanium, oxygen, tungsten, and silicon, and you could go back the same area to improve the quality of your map. This is uh, pretty cool and it's very useful. This was done now with a 3000 EV energy range. Uh, skip this. I want to show you an example of a live mapping, uh, but actually doing uh, some uh, in situ work. So here we we anneal uh, some copper oxide. I will anneal this copper oxide. Um, we anneal the copper oxide. The copper uh, from 2 plus reduces to copper 1 to copper 2. The beauty of this experiment is that uh, we didn't stem and we mapped live the chemistry of copper changing and everything is fully synchronized in digital micrograph. We can actually control uh, uh, the older and uh, we could tell um, uh, we can stop the heating and do our correction or collect the data and uh, we can resume uh, uh, the heating. So the good thing of this is that we scan and uh, we increase the temperature and automatically the software was uh, uh, doing uh, uh, was doing drift correction and it was changing the temperature and it was measuring live with the distribution of uh, copper 2 plus, copper 0, copper 1. 
This actually will show a little bit more in quality here, uh, better in quality. So you start from 100 degrees, the copper two is blue, and little by little you see that this copper is going from uh, uh, copper two plus to copper one plus. So you can see that it's turning uh, all red. This is another example. This is looking at ferroelectric material where we have lead zirconia titanate grown on top of STO and silicon. In one single spectrum, you get pretty much everything in your sample from titanium all the way to lead. This was done in five milliseconds. The quality is still pretty good. You can tell the difference between metallic silicon, the blue, silicon oxide, the black, you see the strontium, but you can also detect uh, uh, the lead and the zirconium as well. And you get pretty good map. This was done in five milliseconds exposure time. You can see like a layer of uh, silicon oxide in there at the interface between uh, uh, silicon and STO. So probably when they deposited the STO, the silicon was already oxidized uh, on the surface. The interesting thing is actually the quality of the spectra. So the titanium in the case of the lead zirconia titanate and the STO, these are all uh, titanium uh, uh, four plus. But because the coordination of the crystal is different uh, between the STO, these are perovskites, where uh, the distance between um, each uh, uh, oxygen and uh, uh, titanium atoms is constant. In this case, the crystal is slightly distorted, and as a result, you see a change in the fine structure, which uh, we can appreciate. Um, we can also shrink the exposure time from five millisecond to one millisecond, but you're still able uh, to collect the uh, pretty good quality maps, including uh, uh, the map of the lead. And this was done in one single minute, okay? But still pretty good spatial resolution. Um, you can also use EOS, and this is uh, to study objects uh, uh, from the space. This is an um, analysis that we did, uh, we did on uh, interplanary uh, dust, essentially on uh, meteorite um, and you know, people are interested in uh, oxygen and uh, iron. So this is a map of oxygen and iron. But we want to do, we want to go beyond that. We want to map the chemistry because from the chemistry of iron, you could tell uh, how long this object was in the space, what it went through, etc. So, so you can see that we have iron in three different uh, states, metallic iron in blue, iron sulfide in red. You see the fine structure is significantly different, um, but we also have uh, iron oxide. OK, in uh, iron oxide three plus. So you can have the distribution of all these three different phases. So this is actually important. And like I said, it gives you a lot of information about the material, about the history of this material. Now, I just want to spend the last few minutes of this presentation talking about data detection there and uh, essentially talking about uh, data detection, show you the like give continuum K3 system. So. Uh, but before uh, we jump into the detection, we have to understand uh, what uh, traditional technology is. So here we have a traditional fiber cable camera where we expose the scintillator. Uh, the scintillator is a material that is used to convert electrons to photons. So you, com you expose uh, the last scintillator to electrons. So then uh, these electrons are converted to light. And the light uh, is cabled uh, through fiber optics here, this, uh, this region here to a CCD for a CMOS for a detection. There's quite a lot of scattering in there and that actually uh, doesn't help in terms of resolution. In the case of a data detection, everything is nicely confined and you expose uh, uh, the sensor straight to the electrons. So now so everything is nicely confined and that improves a lot the resolution. Now, uh, we do something called the counting, and when we do counting, uh, uh, this is what we do in, uh, to improve uh, dramatically the, the quality of the images at the same time to reduce, uh, uh, to reduce the noise dramatically. So we do something called counting, but what is counting? So imagine that one electron is striking this pixel, it would generate the charge that is spread over a neighboring pixel. You can decide to, to read out the old charge. So we call it this accumulation mode because you're accumulating the old charge. Or you could decide that to measure the center of gravity of the electron. Essentially, you measure how much charge uh, this electron is producing uh, uh, over the neighboring pixel. Now you find uh, that most of the charge produced by these pixels, 75% of the charge is localized uh, in these pixels. And you can assign the all your pixel to one electron. But you can also have some uh, super resolution. Essentially, you can localize the pixel with subpixel uh, 
uh, accuracy, and you could tell uh, you can convert essentially your camera from 4K by 4K to 8K by 8K. So using this technology, we were able to uh, that it was very important for cryo EM and uh, going. This is an image of before and after of this uh, uh, this protein here. At the time, this was uh, the highest resolution achievable. But also, this technology can be used uh, for material science. This is an image of a MOF, which is one of uh, uh, one of the most important uh, material uh, for catalytic purposes. Um, and this image actually was acquired with 4.1 electron per ang. So it's pretty amazing, but that shows you that when you can count the electrons, uh, you can really make the difference. Now, if you apply that technology to yields, this is the noise that you measure in the yields of spectrum in general. It's given by four contribution, short noise, um, photoconversion noise, uh, because you have a scintillator, readout noise, and gain noise. So readout noise is electronics. Now you can control the short noise with the exposure time and uh, the beam current. So if you want to get more electrons, but the problem with the gain noise is actually this proportion to the number of counts. And if you bin, you increase the gain noise. So if you can count each single electron at high speed, now you're only left with the short noise. This is where you want to be. This is where you, uh, you run also with an ideal detector. This is a little bit the difference between going direct detection and direct detection. This is you can looking at 1% of nitrogen titanium oxide. You barely see with the regular technology, but with that detection, you uh, can see more clearly. Uh, you have uh, a more pronounced uh, signal to background ratio. So essentially, you are increasing the uh, visibility of an edge. This is important for detectability. Energy resolution, uh, both spectra were done uh, with the 2000 EV energy range. And all of a sudden, now you see in the case of data detection in blue, you see the, uh, the signal is a lot more confined and we have much better energy resolution what you buy with the energy resolution, chemical analysis. So here we have uh, titanium oxide, um, actually strontium titanate, but titanium is four plus. That is detection, you can actually see you have enough energy resolution to tell uh, there is a titanium four plus, but you have energy range uh, to detect uh, uh, the strontium at high energy. Look at the level of noise. This is random and this is no longer random telling you that you know, there is a fixed pattern of noise that is missing in that detection. So what you do normally, oh, sorry. Another example here is actually looking at that detection is looking at two different spectra traces analysis. We have uh, traces of uh, fluorine here. You can see that in more, in more detail. So all what you see here is actually all detector artifacts. And uh, if you do that detection, essentially these detector artifacts are gone and you have a much better visibility for uh, traces. One uh, example, this is actually looking at uh, sample extremely beam sensitive. We have magnesium aluminate on the substrate in black, and also we have a region that contains, uh, um, uh, region that contains, that contains uh, um, vanadium, iron, and uh, aluminum, okay? So you can get very nice spectra. You have a very nice fine structure of uh, magnesium, vanadium there. It's very good. And you can even tell the difference of the aluminum just looking at the, uh, the fine structure of aluminum. And you know you can map this. So you can see the distribution of vanadium. You see the vanadium is like penetrating and diffusing across uh, um, you know, the layer here. You see some uh, regions uh, that this is basically some damage caused by a demo that the customer previously ran with one of uh, the microscope vendors. But the interesting thing is doing atomic analysis here. So if you look at this area, the sample is extremely beam sensitive. You actually move the atoms around with the electron beam. So in this particular case, you see that it's black. This is that was previously damaged. So we looked at this area. Sorry, we looked at this area. And now you can see this is a simultaneous image that uh, you uh, can record uh, pixel by pixel very low beam current, a very short exposure time, and we manage uh, to avoid uh, the damage here. So you see now the vanadium atoms are uh, sitting in between iron atoms here. Also, when you look at this uh, data detection system, you can even venture 
and uh, do very, very high energy edges. So here is looking, um, this is a manganese K map. So essentially we're now combining synchrotron with, uh, with EOS. This is very, very good. And you can even have enough energy resolution to tell and quality to tell that this is a manganese oxide. But again, when your detector is uh, sensitive, you can uh, go look at very, very high energy edges. And with this, I want to thank you for uh, for the attention. If you have any questions, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Paolo Longo, for an insightful talk. Let's begin with today's question and answer round. The first question is, in which industry EELS is most useful and how is it different from other spectroscopic techniques? Okay, this is a good question. So EELS is actually used, uh, it basically has a lot of advantages for every type of, uh, every type of industry. Uh, a lot of people working in uh, carbon-based material, for example, or polymers. Uh, EELS is the only technique because all these materials are made of carbon and EOS has enough energy resolution to tell you differences in the chemistry of carbon. And, but at the same time, uh, we also do uh, pretty well in uh, petrochemical industry, again, for the same reasons, because most the people are interested in carbon. They're interested in um, this uh, sensitive, uh, very sensitive material that damage uh, fast under, uh, easy under the electron beam. And, um, what you want to do, you want to uh, EOS again, you know, it's very, it's very, very sensitive. But the same thing with semiconductor, essentially like EOS is pretty much used in, uh, for, uh, in every type of industry, but as uh, advantages, especially where, uh, you know, you're interested in uh, light materials, for example, like lithium, you know, lithium, uh, there's a lot of uh, research on lithium and uh, lithium is a very, very low energy, essentially is invisible to EDS but it's very much visible to uh, EOS. And I showed you some, uh, some example in, uh, in my presentation. Now, the other technique, you know, like I mentioned before, uh, EDS is something that is complementary. And every time you have energy loss, you also have the, uh, the generation some X-ray. But on the TM, I'm talking about on the TM, there's no any other technique uh, such as uh, EOS that could give you the same type of information and is a sensitive as EOS. The other advantage of EOS is spatial resolution because it gives you the highest spatial resolution. I'm talking about an analytical TM. The equivalent of EOS uh, in a regular, uh, in a, in, um, to some extent, uh, as a surface uh, uh, analysis technique, I would say it could be like uh, XPS. But, so XPS, uh, you know, the EOS, the spectra, the XPS spectra and the EOS spectra are uh, pretty similar. You know, they're very similar. The only difference is the way the material is excited, but essentially the spectra look the same. But the difference is that XPS doesn't show very high spatial resolution, whereas he also gives you the resolution down to fraction of, uh, of a nanometer. OK, thank you. My another question was the same one. What is the difference between XPS and yield spectroscopy techniques, instrumentation and sample wise? Yeah, so XPS essentially is a, uh, is a surface technique. Um, so you uh, so you basically in the case of uh, XPS, you excite your atom uh, with uh, essentially with uh, with the X ray. The case of EOS is with uh, with electrons. So in the case of XPS, so you could get some sort of resolution. Uh, they call it like the, doing this uh, sort of depth resolution. Uh, analysis, but I think, you know, the resolution uh, is probably in the order of uh, 100 of nanometers as opposed to EOS that you get fraction of uh, nanometers, but the spectra are actually very, very similar. Now that, you know, the features you, that you see in the spectra are very similar. Actually, I have a, I have a paper uh, with uh, some of your, uh, uh, we actually with other, uh, with some colleagues uh, at Chennai, Chennai University in India. We published a paper on advanced material and we did some um, uh, comparison between uh, EOS and XPS to study some uh, catalytic system used to uh, purify uh, water essentially to remove uh, arsenic uh, from the water and make the water uh, uh, drinkable. Mm, absolutely good question, good answer. Can boron be detected in P91 boron modified steel? 
Um, I mean, we can detect the boron uh, uh, with yields. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that boron 19 what it is. Um, so I can't answer that question, but you can detect uh, uh, boron uh, with yields. So we can actually we can actually see differences between boron oxide and uh, boron or boron nitride. So we have enough energy resolution to see that. Okay. Is the advancement in spectroscopy an aided advantage in studying stem cell or plant cell? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Is the advancement in spectroscopy an added aided advantage in studying stem cell or plant cell? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are, uh, there are, there, there's a lot of work, uh, uh, a lot of people are now moving uh, uh, from because you know, like uh, he also started initially as a uh, as a material science uh, technique, uh, but now it's actually expanding to uh, life science. And now some example that I didn't have time to show you, but we're actually using eels to study uh, life science uh, specimen. Uh, I'm, you know, most of the example that I have are from uh, a nuclear cell, but I know there is uh, there is some effort on. Uh, doing more analytical uh, studies on uh, uh, plant-based uh, materials. Good. Uh, will TEM and eels be useful for biological samples describing which bioactive compounds are present in the extracts of different solvents? Yeah, of course. Um, there are some examples and there are uh, some uh, ongoing work. Um, so there was some example, for example, uh, the, there are some example for uh, these uh, anti-cancer uh, cures that uh, they use uh, some iron oxide, but the iron oxide could come in different phases, uh, but it's still iron oxide. But in EOS actually we could uh, detect, uh, you know, like because we could distinguish a different chemistry of iron oxide that we could detect, uh, you know, the right, uh, uh, the right compound, you know, the right material. So absolutely there's a, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of work that must be done in that direction, but EOS actually has the advantage that could give you information about uh, about the chemistry. And oh. also, it's very, very sensitive and it doesn't require high beam current, so it's particularly suited to uh, carbon-based material. Most of these biological materials are uh, made of carbon. Okay. Is it possible to obtain yields of less than one atomic percent lighter material dopant like boron in heavy metal oxide like titanium dioxide? Yeah, obviously you need to know the uh, uh, you need to know your amount of uh, of boron that you want to detect. We have software um, uh, in in our in our software in the Getan software. Uh, we have some plugins um, uh, that help you. Uh, understand that the, the, the detectability uh, for a particular uh, material system. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we would have to look at uh, each single case, uh, but there are cases uh, where, uh, you know, even below 0.1% atomic percentage, you can detect uh, the element. But in other cases, uh, it's more complicated even going down to 2%. So it really depends from case to case, but we have software that enable you to run this type of uh, analysis and understand if uh, you know you could get the information uh, using yields. Great. Is it is uh, the last question of the talk is high speed spectroscopy also based on Fourier transformation? Oh no, high speed uh, high speed spectroscopy is essentially is based on how fast uh, you can. Uh, so essentially you have to read out the EOS spectrum. So and in, in order to read out the EOS spectrum, you need to have a fast camera. So the fast, the faster, uh, the faster your camera is, the, uh, uh, the faster uh, you could go. So it's purely due to the instrumentation, essentially how fast you can generate uh, EOS spectra. So you generate an EOS spectrum, now you move the probe to another, to another pixel. So the faster you can read out the spectrum, the faster you can move the probe, and then the faster uh, you can uh, cover a certain area across your specimen. So another question, uh, how can we differentiate lithium KH taken from various lithium compounds, let us say lithium fluoride, lithium carbonate, lithium oxide during lithiated at 1.5 volt sample and SEI layer formed at 0.8 volts as these peaks are very close and difficult to separate. 
Yeah, so the, first of all, um, um, you know, like uh, this is a very good question. Um, so there are uh, there are a lot of papers in literature uh, that shows you like uh, uh, that shows you actually the uh, ion spectra from lithium fluoride, lithium carbonate, uh, lithium hydride, uh, you know, metallic lithium, uh, and because the chemistry is changing, you basically have a change in the fine structure of lithium. So you do have an energy resolution to see all these changes. So that's very important. The other thing is uh, uh, that you have to be able to set up your experiment in a way that you know you are sensitive enough because you know possibly these uh, you know like these changes occur at a very very high speed. So you need to be able to you need to have something sensitive enough that uh, uh, enables you. The allows you to uh, detect uh, these uh, changes. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And um, you know, you can reach out to me via emails if you have any other question. I would like to thank Dr. Paolo Longo for an interesting talk on advances in yields instrumentation and analysis, high-speed spectroscopy with extended energy and dynamic range. We are really grateful, Dr. Paolo Longo, for answering the questions. I would also like to thank our head, Professor Anil Kotentarail, for his continued support in this webinar series. And last but not the least, I thank all the participants for attending this webinar and making this event successful. A link for the feedback form is shared in the question and answer section. Please fill the form. Your valuable inputs are important to us. The registration link for the next webinar is now open on our website. The upcoming talk is on delineating small molecule analysis through ultra high resolution orbitrap mass spectrometry by Dr. Sarvanan Kumar. I request you all to join us for our next talk. Once again, thank you all for making the webinar successful. Stay healthy and safe. Jai Hind.